right, we're joined on the Rain Drakes Hockey Podcast by Ken Danico, a longtime NHL defenseman, a longtime broadcaster with the New Jersey Devils. And Kenny, why don't we start there? Because what a special surprise on the weekend, right? I mean, to spend your entire career with one NHL team, the New Jersey Devils, and then extend that now to a 40th season collectively as a player and as a broadcaster and to be honored in the fashion that you were at the Prudential Center on the weekend – how much of a surprise was it? And uh, then how much does it mean to you to be honored in that fashion? Oh, boy. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. And, <laughs> yeah, it was a real special afternoon, uh, Darren and Ray. I mean, listen, I feel very blessed, grateful, all those kinds of things, and fortunate to be with one organization as long as I have since since 19 years old, really. And, and uh, I didn't expect that they told me before the season that, uh, hey, we're going to honor you, and they said, You've never been at a loss for words uh, before, but you are now. I, I kind of was silent. I go, really? You're going to do this? <laughs> so it, it was very, very special. I mean, I, I, I've been here a long time. I'm grateful for it. And, and not just, you know, the, as a player and broadcaster, but in the community with the fans and kind of as an ambassador. So I do whatever they ask of me, and, <laughs> and it's been a lot over the years. So it was a real special afternoon, a fun afternoon, and – I, I was just great uh, or glad and appreciative they didn't lay an egg. I just want their success and they played a terrific <laughs> hockey game because I know the fans can turn quickly on you. If they oh, lay an egg. But they fired 53 shots. They scored seven goals. And it, it just turned out to be a perfect afternoon. But I, I'm a lucky guy. You know, I've been here a long, long time. I wouldn't want it any other way. That was the team that gave me my opportunity to, to fulfill a dream like a lot of us Canadian kids uh, – playing hockey, youth hockey. So uh, it was a special, special afternoon. And, and they surprised me with my son coming out to sing the national anthem. And that meant the world to me because that's his world. He graduated the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. He's been doing it since a young kid. And uh, that's something that uh, meant a lot. And he did a terrific job. So it was a lot of fun. Gave me a silver stick as well, which I never got <laughs> one when I played my thousandth game. They had heard that. So they uh, kind of combined it with uh, a lot of nice insignias and on the stick of 40 years and a thousand games and all the games played with the devil. Hey, maybe so. Lou has it tucked in a closet somewhere, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know why I never got one, but I just, I think I grumbled about it after a few guys were getting it. I think Travis Ajak got a stick for silver stick for a thousand games. I go, I never got one of those. <laughs> hey, you know, what's funny about that, Kenny is I had been grumbling about not getting one either. Oh, did right? they, maybe they didn't do it in our time, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't think they did. And then somehow Luke Robitaille got hold of it. And so the Kings prevent presented me while I was back there broadcasting a game. I could have been <laughs> more surprised. And I got this, they got me this stick, right? The silver stick. Isn't it amazing, though, to look down at that stick? I mean, you've got lots of memorabilia. I can see your pictures behind you and stuff. But you look at that stick, and your whole career is there. Yes. I just, I find it like one of the greatest things. I was, oh man, I just love it. I love that the Kings did that. And I'm, I, that is awesome. Same? That is really awesome that they did that for it because. Yeah, same thing. And they had heard me grumbling, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way uh, squeaky wheel, man. Squeaky so my wheel. wife, my wife came out and presented it to me, and that was kind of kind of nice. I, it was just a real special afternoon. And I will tell you guys, why you know, I'm I'm still a fan and, and, and like a little kid when it comes to our our legends of the game and great players. And Wayne Gretzky at about midnight that night sent me a text congratulating me. And I was, I, I wake my wife up and say, you're not going to believe this. Wayne Gretzky just texted me and said, <laughs> no, really nice honor. Ken, uh, enjoy it. You know, well-deserved kind of deal. And I was like, uh, like I was back, like I was 10 years old again. Yeah. Even though I played 15 years against him, I was like, I can't believe Wayne Gretzky texted me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought it was really special as well. But uh, we've had great ownership here over the years uh, my first late great owner, John McMullen, you know, was like a second father to me. And I was drafted here the original year in 82. I didn't even know where New Jersey was, guys. Okay, is that, a, is that a true story? Is that a true, true story? Because I had heard, I was going to ask you, somebody said you got drafted <laughs> by New Jersey. 
and you went, I don't even know where that is. Is that, right. that's a true thing? Oh my God, Ray. I've told it so many times in different interviews, but, but it's true. I, you know, we all get that call. No social media, no cell phones back then. Obviously our years we were drafted in 82 and, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm going to get drafted, but I was thinking third round and then whatever, maybe I didn't care when, where my mom wakes me up early in the morning, drafts in Montreal. And it's two hours earlier than Edmonton where I grew up. And my mom, I, I'm a little groggy. I actually believe it or not in my crazy days, went out for a few pops to ease the tension the night before with my <laughs> brother. Cause you could drink in Edmonton at 18. You know? yeah. So, yeah. so I, I did, I just went out to, and uh, my, I'm sleeping and my mom wakes me up at like, I look at the, look over at the, the clock on my nightstand and I go, mom, it's way too early. It's way too early for me to be getting a call. She goes, Kenneth. And when she was serious, she called me Kenneth. And my mom's passed on since as well. But the petite little lady, she goes, Kenneth, come down and take this call. And they go, congratulations, <laughs> Ken, you've been drafted 18th overall. Didn't even have a team name yet. I dropped the phone. Oh. They didn't have a name yet? No name. No name yet, Ray. It was being voted <laughs> on in the New Jer Newark, New Jersey Star Ledger. So you've been – and I dropped the phone when they said, congratulations, you've been drafted 18th. I just couldn't believe it. My mother looked at me go, you've got to be bleeping me. And my mother, Catholic, little Catholic <laughs> lady, never before in her life. And then she goes, well, ask who it is. I didn't ask who it was. I picked the phone back up. I said, oh, by the way. Who is this? They go, it's New Jersey. I covered the phone and said, Mom, where's New Jersey? I swear to God, I would have ran the 2,000 miles to get my opportunity. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. I came here. And fortunately, we were bad early on, as everybody knows. But I wanted to be part of something. I want to do my little part and yeah. understand my role. And I kept telling everybody, we're going to be something someday. And people would laugh at me and I was just grateful I wasn't traded by the time we became good and had yeah. an opportunity to fill a, to fill a second dream, winning a Stanley Cup as, as kids. I used to carry a silver garbage can over my head, pretending it was the Stanley Cup. Uh, that was a second dream. <laughs> Nobody believed we'd ever attain that, but uh, I'm just grateful I got to, uh, you know, it made it that much more yeah. satisfying uh, being with the organization double-digit years and finally – hoisting a cup of, yeah, I didn't know where New Jersey was 40 years later. I love it here. I'm a transplanted Jersey. And, and you know what? I got a great rapport with the fans a lot because, you know, I knew what I was. I wasn't a star player. I was an in, in the trenches kind of guy. And Lou made sure I understood that, what my role was. <laughs> you know, I, I told this many times and I don't want to ramble, but uh, you guys got to hear it. And I'm sure you've heard it maybe. You know, Lou took me in about my fifth year, or his first year, and it was about my fifth year or so. I had been on the second power play because Bruce Driver was out of the lineup uh, injured for four games. Like, and, and Lou didn't know. You know, I got, everybody comes out of junior year, got a little offensive ability. So I, I have some success. I have four points in four games, all excited. You know, everybody wants to do more and, and, and have some fun with some offense along the way. I get taken off the power play as soon as Bruce comes back. And Lou, right away, you know, had commanded such respect. Knew exactly what was bothering me. He says, after practice, can he come upstairs? I wore my emotion on my sleeve. He said, what's bothering you? He knew exactly what was bothering me. He said, well, Lou, I'm yeah, button. I had four games on the power play. I have four points. How come I'm not on the power play anymore? He says, can he sit down? It's pretty simple. He says, I liken my team to an orchestra. There's... In order to make beautiful music, everybody has to play that instrument to a T if we're going to achieve what we're trying to get, what we're trying to do here. He says, there's penis, there's violinists, and the drummers. What category do you think you fall in there? And this is a true story. Lou still tells this, these stories to young guys. We laugh about it, but he always says, you don't mind me using the Ken Danico story because I use it all the time. And I go, yeah, yeah. I go, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I knew what he was saying. And I was angry. And I, I'd stand up to Lou once in a while. Not many guys did. And I'm, yeah, button him. I, I throw the chair. I go, yeah, but I had four points, blah, blah, blah. We all want to do more. He says, look, you master, you're a shot blocking defenseman. You're physical. You protect teammates. That's how you're going to help this team. And if you master that, uh, I'm ready to get up. I throw the chair. I, I'm walking. I go, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm bitter because, you know, I want to do more. 
And, and before I slam the door, he goes, oh, by the way, you master that drum, you're going to play 15 years in this league. If you don't want to be a drummer, he says, I'll call 15 teams and see if they need a violinist. <laughs> um, I laugh about it now, but, but I was so angry, guys. So I threw the chair, I slammed the door, and, and, and I go, you know what? I, 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 I took it to heart. I took it to heart. He said, this guy don't care if I go over the red line. He's got a specific defined role for me. He doesn't care if I score. Yeah, it's nice once in a while to put it in the net because the team gets pumped when you're not a not a goal scorer. But when I retired in 2003, Lou says, to, I, I, you know, we have a little press conference and I turned to Lou and I said, just to piss you off, I played 20 years. He knew exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> he got a chuckle out of it. But obviously I've got an incredible room of power. If Dr. Yeah. McMullen was with him, if Dr. McMullen was – my second father, Lou, was like my uncle, and we laugh about all these things now, but uh, it, it was an important conversation that had to be had because, you know what, I believe I would have been out of the league in five years if I was that uh, jack-of-all-trades kind of master. Yeah. Not. But he made me aware what was going to make me successful in the National League. And it's a, great, it's a great story for kids and youth hockey and that, that you can find your niche, even if you're not the most highly skilled guy, whatever it yep. may be but you understand your role and what it takes to be part of the team. When, when you guys are building, you're that young, by the way, that's an amazing story. I can't believe you actually stood up to Lou because <laughs> oh, yeah. no, you know, he well, says not easy. Guy do that, Ray. He, he was like a Wolverine. He was ready to jump on the table. And I'd be, <laughs> oh, it goes better. And I'll let you think. So he had a little uh, secretary, small little lady, Mary, who sat outside his office and she heard the chair go and she heard a little uh, voices getting high. So when I retired in 2003, she goes, congratulations, Kenny, uh, uh, you know, on a, on a wonderful career. She goes, do you remember that time you and Lou were in the office? She says, I was going to call 911. I wasn't <laughs> sure for who though. <laughs> she goes, I don't know if I was calling for you or Lou. <laughs> Oh, man. So through all of that, you guys, you know, Lou cobbles together this group and, you know, eventually bring Jacques Lemaire in to coach. And that, how did they get you guys to understand, was it Lou, was it Jacques, was it both? Like you guys played this impossible style to play against. I, I remember sitting on the bench next to Pat Flatley and we're playing you guys, and you guys have smothered us. It's halfway through the game. We got about seven shots. And Flats goes, they're not even sweating. Look at them. <laughs> it's like we were so pissed off. We were trying so hard. You guys were just so locked in. How did that, how did that all happen? You, you know, Ray, it's interesting. And, I, you know, we always talk about the trap and people mention it. That word was never mentioned by Lemaire or anybody in our room. It was just responsibility away from the puck, cutting the ice in half, and it was a five-man unit. The, Montre the great Montreal Canadiens, the high-flying Montreal Canadiens that Jacques was uh, a member of and, and, and uh, such a key part in Hall of Famer, and Larry Robinson, that's the style they played. It was counterattack. You still created a lot of offense because what we never get credit for, which is okay because we have championships to show for it, we were always one of the highest scoring teams in the National Hockey League. So it wasn't like we didn't – the connotation is we didn't bring offense. If you look, nobody says it in the media over the years, and I always defend it because it takes away from how skilled our forwards were. They just got them to buy in of when you don't have the puck, you're responsible defensively. You take the middle of the ice away. It allows one defenseman to stand up at the red line. So these guys, but we scored in, in 2000. We were the second highest scoring team in the National Hockey League. 2001, when we lost to Colorado in the finals, we were number one in the National Hockey League in scoring. Lemaire wasn't there yet, but people don't, don't realize that. So it's like, while you're making the game boring, I'm going, so we score a lot of goals. We defend extremely well. And, oh, yeah, we got a Hall of Fame goaltender, Marty Bordeaux. That's not good. That's what we did. But it was winning. It was a winning recipe. And that's what the, how the Montreal Canadiens played. And that was the genius part of Lou Lamorello. We were finally getting better. We had a good young core. They were drafting well because we'd win 17 games a year in the mid-'80s. And then eventually, by 90, the early 90s, bringing in Jacques Lemaire and 
and Larry Robinson to pull it all together. Mm. The guys that didn't have enough fingers uh, to put all those rings on that they've had as, mm. as players or management or coaches, the success they had. And everybody, look, we wanted to win. We wanted to get to that next level. After making the playoffs in 88 and having a good run for the first time we made the playoffs, then it took seven more years to get there. But that was probably the, the, the most intelligent, genius thing Lou did. He says, I got to bring in guys to get Jacques Lemaire and Larry Robinson to come to the Devils organization to kind of put it all together to get to that next step. Because you know how hard it is to win, Ray, and, and Darren, and obviously yeah. to go four grueling rounds. But I didn't really even listen too much in the meetings or practice. I knew my role, and I just, you know, did what I had to do. So, <laughs> I, so I, you know, everybody says it's this ingenious system and we stifled teams, but I, you know what? It was just competing, playing hard. But yeah, the forwards were so responsible and collectively all four lines. Randy McKay in 1995, fourth liner on the crash line, had eight goals in the playoffs. So that kind of sums it up. It was just well balanced. Yeah. You know what though, Ken? You just said something. I think I follow the game really close. And when I played, I was one of those hockey nerds. I was always trying yeah, to follow. Me too. Uh, I had no idea you guys led the league in goals for. No. I had no idea. No. Because that, all I thought was I'd come out of the game exhausted, working my ass off and getting nowhere. Like, we, whenever we'd, we'd get down there, like, Marty was a rumor down there we're like jesus I, I guess he's in goal down there we can't get there <laughs> ray that that is why i brought it up because i've got on some canadian radio stations everything and they kind of downplay and things about the trap and this and that for hockey i'm going have you guys ever looked at the stats just to let you know and we're always top five in scoring to top goals in the national hockey no league. idea yeah. from 95 to 2003 when we went to the cup four times and, and, and won it three, we scored goals, but yeah, we played responsible. And, and I just think it takes away from all the, we had so many high end skilled forwards that just, they would sacrifice. So yes, people say, well, isn't it about scoring goals and all the fancy plays? Of course, they just didn't cheat the game when, yeah. when it wasn't there, they didn't force it at one on three, which we see everybody wants to highlight real goals. They just played right the right way when their opportunity came. Yeah, we made plays and scored, but a lot of people don't realize it. And I heard nobody say this, and correct me if I'm wrong, when the Los Angeles Kings beat the Devils in 2012 finals, by the way, they were last in the National Hockey League in goals for. I never hear anybody talk about, oh, playing too defensive. Yeah, Jonathan Quick was outstanding. They were dead last. None of our teams were. We were always top five. <laughs> no no uh, idea. In the I, I, All right, I that's why I brought it up. <laughs> well, I, it's awesome, but it's it's a it, honestly, I can almost guarantee nobody knows that, or very yeah, few people know. would know that. Now, when I think of you guys as well, like you know, I I think of you know the, the defense that you guys had, like you know, the left side of your defense was slightly ter slightly terrifying, you know, like. <laughs> You know, the, I, I tell this story. Marty McGinnis was a rookie in our team, and we're in. We're saying like, Marty, whatever you do, he was a right shot left winger, and we're like, don't cut across the middle there because yeah. like, Stevens people, might get you. <laughs> he might get you, and if you get far enough, and he's not on the ice, Danico's going to get you in the far <laughs> side, and like that, you know, you got to be careful. And first shift, Marty cut across, and Scott happened to be standing there and that was the end of Marty's night. It was like, isn't it, <laughs> isn't it, isn't it amazing, Ray, how, uh, you know, Scotty Stevens talk a lot about him. And I know the hits today different. They protect the players at all costs. And I agree with that. That's the way it is. But it was applauded when we got a shoulder to the gym. That's, that was the way the game was played back then. That was part of it. But here's a guy, six foot one, 215 pounds. And nobody saw him coming in the middle of the ice. That was the timing, impeccable timing he had, like a middle linebacker in football, and nobody did it better from that standpoint. And then, you know, you also had a call in white along the way as we we uh, continued to, you know, try to win cups. He came in in 2000, and he was a big, nasty lefty. Lou always had wanted a big fit, and Scotty had a lot of offense early in his career, yeah. so he kind of redefined his role a little bit. Because that's what they told him to do. That's kind of what it was. Yeah. He led our team mm. in points one season. 
his first or second year with the Devils. He led the team in points with 70-something points. He dropped all the way to 25, but we're still winning at 30 points. We're still still winning and competing for the Stanley Cup because, again, that's that's what defined roles mean and how you have success as a team. Um, Scotty just changed, and then Lou liked to have three physical, <laughs> abrasive defensemen and three plays still – I wanted puck movers, so that's where you had Needham. I remember Falski and, you know, Sean Chambers back in the early 90s was an underrated, gifted offensive player. So, obviously, uh, Lou, Lou liked offense. Everything she did, he loved offense. He just had, and LaMera and Robinson, you just had to, um, you know, play the game the right way on both sides of the puck, but he liked that combination. And Larry Robinson, I'll tell you guys, like, I played 10, 11 years in the league before he came to the team, and I've always said – I learned more in the first week about defense than I did in my first 10 years from Larry Robinson. Just a brilliant guy, brilliant uh, teacher, wonderful person, legendary player. We know that. But he just came up to me my first week and said, Dano, don't take that intensity and toughness away and all that and that passion you bring to the game. But he said, you're wasting way too much energy. He taught me about dots and playing and taking the middle away and using my stick way more effectively. I was amazed at some of the little tricks of the trade he'd teach me. And I'm going, he's going to pro- – he prolonged my career. I bet you five more – five, six, seven more years just, uh-uh. awesome. just from teaching me how to play the game properly. He says, don't take it away. When the hit's there, great. But you don't have to run side to side. Don't have to go down all the time. He didn't like defensemen leaving their feet as much. And we had a lot of good mm-hmm. shot blocking defensemen, but it was all about stick position. The way kind of the game's played today as far as mm. – you need a good stick, we hear, for defensemen. You need to take the middle away. Don't, you know, these great players of today, if you rush at them, they're too skilled. They're going to beat you. So it's about keeping your feet square and about just all the little nuances a defenseman learns. And I'm like, man, he made the game way easier for me my last eight or nine years. <laughs> um, okay, I heard a story. Please tell me it's, it's fact because it would be amazing. <laughs> Power play goal, shorthanded goal in the same game. <laughs> oh boy, my favorite! And then Billy Garen did tell the story. I don't even remember all the stories about me. There was a, a lot of them, but some of the teammates, some of the teammates uh, commented. You know, and when it was my 40th anniversary, Mike Morel from NHL.com did a terrific uh, story, and they talked to some teammates about a few things. And Billy Garen was a youngster. Yeah, we were in Washington. And I, everybody knows I was a nut. I mean, I, I, and just passionate. So th- we were in watch John Connors, the coach, and he was screaming at me to get off the ice, I think, or something along those lines. Billy didn't elaborate, but but I came to the bed. Or Shanahan told the story. Excuse me, Brendan Shanahan. But Billy loved it, too. So uh, two great teammates. And Shanny, you know, I came to the bench when he's yelling at me, get off the ice, because I came out of the penalty box, and I think we had a power play going on or something. I happened to catch, get a power play goal late, and it wasn't supposed to be out there. <laughs> I had a shorthanded goal, so it was a rare two-goal night. I, I, I had that, I think, <laughs> once or twice in my career. And I fought one of their guys, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I come to the bench, I go, power play goal, shorthanded goal, toughest guy in the league, what else do you want from me? And <laughs> so... so so kind of looked at me in stunned disbelief, like, and Connie was a no-nonsense guy. Our bench is just cracking up. The Washington Capitol bench, that's the Shannon's, just looked at me and goes, this guy's insane. <laughs> but it was one of those rare, a true story, one of those rare nights where, you know, everything happened, uh, you know, from what you dream of doing kind of thing. Yeah, right, Even right. though I knew I wasn't a goal scorer. So... I, the guys got a chuckle on the bench, and I, I was just—I was just one of those guys who just let it all out, my emotion on my sleeve. But Shani and, and Garrett and all these guys tell stories; they love it, so uh, it, it was fun. But it's true, Ray. <laughs> oh, it's, it's just so, so good, good. Man. so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, ga- I'm going to ask you—I'm going to ask you one last thing. Drake's going to ask you about the current Devils team, but you used to wear. You know, you knew you intimidated guys, right? Like you knew you scared guys, and you had that helmet, that that thing. It you know, the, it was a win well, wasn't it? 
No, I had the big Cooper. <laughs> the Cooper but it was of, way down low and like right above your I eyes. can't believe you remember those things, right? Oh, I remember <laughs> because I'm like, I'm not going in there. I don't like that part. <laughs> As we know, the, the, the game way back then, and, and like I always say, I've gone to the times. I love the game today and where it's gone and, and the skill sets of, of these players. I mean, the things they can do with the puck and the skating and Speed is amazing, but our game was an intimidating game, and, you know, and I had a role to try and be one of those guys and yeah, keep the puck out of my net, but that was all part of the persona, right? I mean, you, you had to intimidate back then, and that was our time. We loved it. We had fun. There's so many guys that I scrapped over the years that I've become dear friends with. That's what people don't know, that we absolutely, that you hated as a player, whether it's Ty Domi, Rick Tock, and all these guys that I've become dear friends with. Because we found out we're, we're a lot alike. We, we just wanted to win, and, and that was part of it back in our day. But, yeah, I tried to be as intimidating as I could be, Ray. Uh, and that was part of my role. Well, you play. were successful. You were yeah. totally <laughs> successful. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, we go on and on and on with the great stories of the New Jersey Devils. Which hey, you're such you know a big part Darren, of quick, Yeah. Darren, quickly, my wife says, you were such a big teddy bear and a – and a wuss now, I, I, she'll watch a video and go, you were a little crazy back then. I go, yeah, I, I go, I, that's so not me. But it, it was, the, the, you know, game face, getting the game face on. And I knew how I was going to stay in the league. And that was a physical, robust style. But she laughs now and looking at some YouTube stuff. She goes, you were a wacko. I go, I, I didn't realize I did some of those things along the way. As so many of the other players in our era did. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's fantastic. Uh, before we let you go, we'd be remiss, clearly, if we didn't talk about today's edition of the New Jersey Devils. And, uh, you know, there have been some growing pains to get to the point that they're in Ooh. now. Swinging with the big boys, right, in the Metropolitan Division. Do you expect, and you do their games, do you expect that there'll be some more growing pains with this group? Or have they turned that corner, Dano, where they're they're going to challenge, they're going to battle for a playoff spot this season? Oh, Darren, that's that's a question for the ages. And obviously, I'm hoping the latter, that they're, they've taken that step. Look, I put it in perspective. They're only 10 games in. They've had some good starts in the past. And then it's faltered right along the way. Ha- Having said that, it does have a different feel because you can see the core group of Hughes and Heischer and Brat and Sharon Govich and Mercer. I can go on down the list. These are good hockey players. These guys yeah. are getting tired of losing. It has been very tough there the last handful of years, but you're seeing their game mature. You're seeing them just understand what it takes to win. And I give general manager Tom Fitzgerald a lot of credit. Now he, he mm-hmm. finally realized they're – they're ready to take a step, or he's hoping they're going to take a step in the offseason and adds a plot. I know he's injured now, but he's going to play a key part and, and was playing very well when he uh, to start the season. And Eric Halla, who, who's been – he's a terrific pro and kills penalties, wins face-offs, does all those things, hasn't provided much offense yet, and that will come. He's had chances. But my point is these guys understanding uh, every shift, situational play – up 3-2, down one nothing. how to play. They just didn't know how to play in the past because it's all go, go, go. They've got a fast team. They've had that for the last couple of years or a quick team. But the puck moves faster than players. We all know that. And now it's about defensemen getting it up to their forwards, moving the puck quickly so they can get into transition. And they've exposed teams. It's been a, a real good 10 games, but they're so much better in the back end. But the veterans that they've insulated some of these young guys with, Brendan Smith, brings a little sandpaper, plays the game the right way, uh, and plays hard. These guys have come in and brought provided some leadership now, and everybody's having fun. They, they believe in themselves a little bit here. You can see it in the past. It was kind of like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm not saying it won't. Who knows? But now uh, they've got four lines all contributing. There's been no passers. Where the big difference is for me, Darren and Ray, their back end. I mean, they got six guys that they can throw out there against top players in the National Hockey League. They're big, they're tall, they're, they have reach, they use their sticks well, they take the middle of the ice away, and they have forwards that are responsible. So Lindy Ruff and his staff, the new guys he's added, have really implemented a system in their end. I'll use an example. The other night, 
They've been dominant most nights, even in their losses. We know that. And that's not going to continue as far as the metrics and everything. Shots for, shots against, they're near the top. But they, they were on their heels. They were a little flat going the way all the way out west. But I was watching, and, and, and it just put a smile on my face because it used to be like the Keystone Cops, and before you know it, they're down 2 nothing because they're spending time in their zone. But there was composure. Everybody was just, okay, we don't have it yet, but just defend properly. Take the middle away. Uh, you know, don't panic. There was always panic, and and now they're, they, they're, they're responsible. The defense are really good at keeping the middle clean. They block a lot of shots and the goaltending, as we cross our fingers, we know it was a disaster <laughs> last year. Yes, injuries was part of that. The U7 guys have made the big timely saves. I always say we applaud guys that have a 40, 50 save night. Well, if you're a team, you really don't want to give up 40 or 50 shots. And they're not doing that. They're giving up 25, 24 or less tonight. But it's making the timely save in a 0-0 game. Blackwood did that against Vancouver. Vanacek did it against the Stanley Cup champs, Colorado Avalanche when it was a tight, closely contested game. So that gives these guys confidence when these guys are, are making some saves that they have to have that changes the whole complexion of a game uh, when it's 0-0 or one nothing, And they just couldn't mm. get that save in the years mm. past. But these two guys, so far anyway, so far are, are doing the job as well. Awesome. Well, creeping closer to the good old days. Uh, Ken, I can tell you this with certainty – um, we're going to have you back on the Rain Dregs podcast. We'll wait a little oh. deeper into the season here. We'll get to the <laughs> because I could just tell Ray's got a thousand questions. I, you, you know what? You know, let me give you one story quickly. Uh, yeah. And we'll end this because I can go on forever and we can tell some funny <laughs> stories and crazy stories. And Ray hears about them as well. But Ray and me played together on Team Canada many, many moons ago in the World yes. Championship. It was one of the greatest times I'd ever had. And we hung out. I think we were in Sweden and then, uh, yeah, Sweden, right, Ray? Right? Yeah, yeah, we were, it was in Sweden. Yeah. It was a good We started in Germany. We had a blast. We, we had some fun, too, as well. But I remember, I think it was Ray and me. I, I know I was, anyway. We're in Germany. I'm, I'm going, I just hope teams that lose in the first round, I don't get sent home. We were always talking about that, right, Ray? Because they kept bringing guys over. And we're yeah. like, you, you're looking at the series and you're actually hoping the teams that lose don't have anybody in your position. <laughs> Mike, you're like, oh, that guy, he won't come. That's okay. He could, Their team could lose. But we made it. We I made think, it. Ray, did we room together, I believe? Uh, yeah, I roomed with your luggage. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It's so long ago, but I have such... Oh, it, it's 30... Ken, it's 30 years ago, man. Like, how did that happen? 35 years ago. 35 years. As they say, time flies. But I just have such fond memories of... You, you kind of reflect on everything in your career yeah. and those were special moments i mean i was so great like oh they're picking me to go over and play for team canada and i, I was just over the moon i would have done anything to to get that opportunity awesome. and we had a lot of fun and, and i remember yeah. me and ray were were uh, <laughs> chum buddies back then you know going to the ice cream parlors uh, a lot yes. of <laughs> germany's famous for ice cream <laughs> a lot of fun back there. <laughs> that's awesome all right kenny well we appreciate uh, you joining us man and like i said we'll, we'll we'll get you back on the podcast later in the season thanks for everything yeah it sounds good guys thank you for having me a lot of fun and keep up the great work as well you guys uh, i read you darren constantly see you ray all the time on tv and you're doing a fantastic job so keep it up fellas Thanks a lot, and congratulations, Ken. That's an amazing accomplishment. 40 years with the New Jersey Devils. Amazing, man. Appreciate it. From the bottom of my heart, guys, really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning into our YouTube channel. And while you're here, why don't you do us a solid? Hit like yeah. and subscribe. Yeah, you'll get access to all the latest uploads. You can stay updated on the latest news and interviews from the Ray and Drags Hockey Podcast. It only takes a couple of seconds, and from what I'm told, it helps with our algorithm thingamajig. Anyway, yes. we appreciate it.